All right, guys, I hinted at it in the last episode. There's two major, major, enormous tasks that I have to tackle before the project can go any farther forward. So as you know, the, um, the order of events, the sequence of events has to be get the outside buttoned up so that I don't have any more leaks. And when there's no more water coming to the inside, that's when I can tackle the really fun part, uh, which was supposed to be the, the whole project when I bought the motorhome was just supposed to be maybe interior work, right? The outside looked fine, but no. So you gotta get the outside sealed up before doing the inside because I don't want the water to damage any of the work that I do in here. So I'm not even gonna start to, to, to do the really fun stuff uh, until I've got it fixed. And uh, somebody else in the comments section uh, ages and ages ago in the videos uh, made a good point. And he said, why don't you get the thing mechanically sound before you start working on the coach? Well, that's a good point too. So maybe even before I wanna button up the outside of the motorhome, first I wanna get the mechanics just purring. Well, that engine does pretty, pretty good for a 40 year old engine. It starts up pretty easily. Um, it is carbureted, so if I start it up and I don't let it come up to full temperature and I turn it off, I can't get it started again until the gas sort of evaporates out of the float for the carburetor. So, you know, carbureted engines. That's why everybody puts the, um, whatever that, 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 that EFI fuel injection kit on top of this, this block. But there's also, you know, there's mechanical checks to be done. And certainly the experts there, I'm thinking Jim Bounds has a, a whole... Uh, sequence of events that he normally goes through to, to check out these these engines but that's um that's kind of a problem for another time as far as I'm concerned the engine getting you down the road just leaves you stranded but the running gear the suspension and all that uh, really could cause you to crash or lead to more severe problems than that so the number one mechanical issue that I need to fix as we've discussed previously is the front suspension those all those loose bushings because they're all dry rotted away I need to get rid of those and um, yeah I think I, I got a little play in the um, in the bearings up there so I need to replace that and because I would be replacing those parts I could go stock right and you know my dad has this rule never deviate from stock well the reason for that is because the engineers at you know GMC there was a whole team of engineers fighting with each other and they put one guy and his whole job was to design the knuckle and the, and the steering components, you know, f for this motorhome. And uh, he went through school, <laughs> you know, four years of his life, maybe six years through engineering school and all that. Then all the on the job training to become a, in charge of that job. And who am I, the DIYer, to think that I can do it better than him? You can't, which is why you never deviate from stock because you're basically betting that you're smarter and better at doing X, Y, Z than the guy who designed it in the first place. Now it's true that uh, the, the, the the car companies, they cut corners, they make a lot of mistakes here and there, and they do need to pump out a product, and so they'll send things that are half-baked out, but not, I mean, maybe in 1978 they were still doing that. It's, it definitely isn't the case anymore. So, yeah, I try to never deviate from stock. But in this case, the CV joints are made out of the most impossible to find uh, material in the world, that being unobtainium. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think you might be able to get some in the aftermarket. People who have done this uh, this this conversion that I'm about to do uh, might have their old CV joints left over and they might sell you them if they're not broken. So you might be able to get used ones, but eh. I'd rather go with some modern componentry that I know isn't gonna work. And guess what, guys? It's stock, in a way. It comes off of a, of a big four-wheel drive truck. So yeah, I'm talking about Manny's front-end conversion. So that's what we're, uh, we're gonna do, I think, in this episode. So the two big problems to solve, paint, well, first we got to finish the bodywork and sanding and all that, getting ready for paint. Then we got the, the front end installation. So in this episode, we're gonna start with the mechanics underneath there. Wish me luck, let's get to it. Last month, I found myself on a solo road trip down south to Reno. And so I swung over to the Bay Area to pick up this whole front end kit from Manny's Transmission, otherwise known as Manny's Trannies. I don't think anybody calls it that. <laughs> All right, so uh, yeah, this is everything I should need to really modernize the the whole you know the whole suspension and uh, drive line out there at the wheels, the front wheel drive uh, components. So we got these increased 
brake calipers. Those are pretty burly. We got the wheel spacers. We got those nice uh, discs. Man, that thing will stop well after this kit is put in place. And most importantly, we've got these um, top A-arms. You can see they've been welded and modified by Manny himself. And the only thing I have to do is figure out how to modify the lower A-arms. Apparently there's some pressing that needs to be done that's kind of intense. So yeah, you guys have seen the instruction set before. Uh, apparently written by uh, some lady who did this herself. So if she can do it, I should be able to do it, I hope. I hope she's not more skilled than me. Well, I've got the motorhome moved over to the side here. I put it on the ramps to get it nice and level. I've got enough room to really get at everything here at the, at the front end. <clears throat> I need to jack the front end into the air high enough so that the suspension tops out. I love this jack. I got this a couple years ago and it's made out of aluminum so it's really lightweight and it's just, it's a pleasure. Best floor jack I've ever had, but one and a half tons. That is pretty wimpy. These are my jack stands. I've had them forever and they're rated at two tons each. So um, that should be pretty substantial. That's 4,000 pounds, so 8,000 pounds total holding up the front end. Now the motorhome has a GVW, gross vehicle weight recommendation of uh, 12,000 pounds, but it's currently completely empty. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot stripped out of it. So I'm going to guess that there's not, there can't be, what, 8,000 pounds on that front end. That would be more than my entire Toyota truck over there. Now, I was able to use that jack previously to get this up off the ground, but it did seem to be struggling. And you'd think that I could just put the jack on this side, jack it up, put the jack stand under it, and then go to that side, put the jack stand under that side, so one and then the other, and I'm not overloading my jack, but you can't do it that way. This is very important, you guys. Apparently, when you do it that way, the whole motorhome chassis twists and then the, the, uh, the coach, the shell here, has to twist as well and you're going to break your windshields. So you have to jack it from the center line using a single powerful jack. I just went to break those lug nuts loose while the tires are still on the ground so that I can, you know, easily get the wheels off once I jack it up and the lug nuts weren't even tight. Now. I don't think I've ever taken that wheel off, but you know, it's been a couple of years sitting here in the driveway. I might have and just not remembered it. So that could be my fault, but I know for absolute certain that I have not taken the rear wheels off and those lug nuts are just as loose. Now you can see every other lug nut here is basically finger tight. Yep, see, <laughs> I'm just breaking these loose. And so the four, these four are gonna be finger tight and then these four are gonna be real tight. Uh, a lot tighter than the finger tight ones. So I definitely did not do this and uh, I would not walk away from it. Yeah, see that's that one's much tighter. So you know what this means? That clunk noise that I was hearing from the front end that was sketching me out so badly could have just been loose lug nuts. But loose lug nuts are nothing to be trifled with because a little bit of play there in your lug nuts will shear off the studs that the lug nuts attach to and your wheel will fall off and that can lead to, you know, catastrophic, the motorhome's dead, you're dead, everything's dead. So lug nuts must be tight. You never walk away from the job without tightening down all your lug nuts. I've got the uh, jack stands and the jack for safety. So the wheel is up off the ground. Check this out, watch the lug nuts versus the wheel. You see that? I'm almost positive that the clunk noise I was hearing was coming from the loose lug nuts. Thankfully, this is what's called a hub-centric rim. So you see right there, the rim, all of the weight of the, of the tire is being transferred into the rim here, which comes down this flange and goes right there to the hub, where the hub meets the rim. On m most cars these days, we have what's called lug-centric. So the lugs have a conical profile to them, and all of the weight is borne by the studs here on the wheel. So it was just starting and stopping that were inducing stresses onto the lugs. Not as tragic as it would have been with a hub-centric design. All of the aluminum wheels, like the Alcoa wheels that you get for these motorhomes these days, they're all lug-centric. So I prefer the hub-centric design. I'm gonna be keeping these steel rims with the hub-centric. You just can't get it anymore. They stopped making it in the 80s. 225-75R 16s. So I have 16-inch hub-centered steel rims. These are rare. Almost nobody has these. Everybody's got these 16.5 rims that came stock on the motorhome and the 16.5 inch rims are much harder to find rubber for. So if you have 16.5 you're likely going to want to upgrade to the uh, alloy aluminum 
hub centric rims. They'll work just fine for you. All right, the wheels are off and there's so much room for activities. So time to get to work on uh, taking all that apart, but I'm going to wait because there's a couple of tools that should be arriving in the mail soon to help me uh, get this all apart. In the meantime, I want to revisit these side LED lights. Before I remove the wires, this is what the blue and the brown wire, which came from the headlight assembly right down there, they went up this wiring loom right here, popped out, and went into that hole there, and to the single incandescent bulb. So a lot of you guys may have the classic rig with these bulbs, and you may want to replace these bulbs with the brighter and less likely to burn out. Well, LED bulbs last forever, so not forever, forever, but they last a very long time. So you guys could just pull that out and put an LED bulb in there if the wiring was correct. So I thought maybe I'd uh, make something that's universal, that everybody can use, and also gets my side blinker turning into a blinker uh, now that I have an LED in there. And the easiest way to achieve that is going to be just clip these two wires and put a little module in between the two wires, right? So you basically clip the wires, stick a little box there where the two wires come in from this side and the two wires come in from that side, and all of a sudden, hey presto, it's like magic. This just works as both a blinker and a running light. But conceptualizing such a module is a lot easier than actually coming up with one. Now, you guys remember in the last video I was talking about this double relay circuit which might potentially work. The problem with this relay circuit is it's illegal. Back to this vehicle code guideline from the state of California, we can see that um, the side mirror rear view uh, uh, lamps need to flash simultaneously with the rear turn signal lamps. And well, okay, that's relating to the side mirrors and not the, uh, the actual side um, blinker slash running light. Right, okay, you could make that argument. But here in the federal guidelines that I found, it says that the uh, the two turn signals need to flash simultaneously. So everything that I found talking about the different uh, turn signal indicators says that they need to flash simultaneously. So that seems to be a universal thing. And if they are out of phase, if the front is flashing like this and then the side flashes like that, then we have a problem. And if you follow the logic of this circuit, when the running lights are not on and just the turn signal is going through, it will blink simultaneously with the, uh, the front and rear uh, blinkers. But when you turn the running lights on, then the positive signal from the turn signal turns the running lights off, which causes the, uh, the turn signal to blink an opposite phase from the front and the back. So this would not be a law abiding technique and we need to come up with something more fancy. Thankfully, I've been known to dabble and play with Arduinos. Here's a project where I was experimenting with these little stepper motors. And then there's this one where you can see I've got these 16 LEDs blinking in series. So these are individually addressable and I can change uh, in software, I can change up the pattern to be whatever pattern I want. Now, we only have two LEDs on the motorhome that we're currently trying to, um, you know, the, the blinkers, and they got to blink simultaneously. So, yeah, we don't have to worry about any fanciness like this. Totally not necessary for our current project. This is the Arduino I'm going to use. It's an Arduino Pro Mini, and this is the programmer module. But once we've programmed it, the Mini gets separated, and that is a standalone board. The only thing you need this for is to plug into the computer to get the program onto the chip. But the problem with Arduinos is they run on five volts maximum. We need to get the 12 volts from the battery and the alternator in the motorhome stepped down to only five volts so that we don't burn up uh, the chip here. And that's what this little doohickey is. It's a buck converter or a step down voltage regulator. So I can just connect the wires here coming in from the battery and output right there, five volts. Now this uh, board right here does have an onboard uh, buck converter, but it's not very good. So we definitely need an external one to power this thing from the battery from the motorhome. And this here is the mock-up. This is a 12 volt battery pack. Plugging it in feeds power through the buck converter into the Arduino. So it's now running on five volt logic stepped down from 12 volts. And these two push buttons here are my analog. I'm just gonna press them, but uh, by, my, by pressing them, I'm emulating the 12 volt pulse that would come through uh, the wiring of the motorhome to tell the Arduino what to do. So this one here, we'll just call this the, um, the running lights. So if I turn that on, if I press that button, you can see that the yellow light goes on, okay? So then this button here will be the turn signal, and if I press it like a turn signal, you can see that the turn signal 
is activating like that. If I let off of that one, so the running light is off, the turn signal still functions, and of course the running light functions by itself as well. So this looks awesome, good to go. Problem is we're suffering from the exact same problem as we were with the relay diagram. Namely, when the turn signal is just a turn signal, it, it's in phase. So as I push my thumb down here, you can see the turn signal lights on. But when I have the running lights on and the turn signal as well, it's in opposite phase. If I push my thumb down, it turns the turn signal off. Now to fix this, I timed the blink of the motorhome's turn signals. And those clever engineers got the little click click switch down to be exactly one second for a full cycle. So on and off are each half of a second or 500 milliseconds. So I can program the Arduino to say, if you've got a signal coming from the running lights and you get a signal from the blinker, wait 500 milliseconds before turning the turn signal off. And that will put the turn signal back into phase with the front and the back blinkers. Okay, so that's the first problem, which has a solution. I just need to implement it. But the second problem is the LED bulb right here, which was just to simulate to see if I got my coding correct. This is just a little five volt LED. In fact, it's less than that because it's got a resistor soldered on one of the legs. So that, I cannot just plug this into the side marker lights on the motorhome currently. I need to power 12 volts through to those LEDs. And as we covered, the Arduino here is not capable of handling 12 volts. Really, it can only deal with 3.3 volts, but there's some fanciness on here that allows five volts to be, you know, certain jobs you can do with five volts. But for the logic level, you need 3.3 volts to be sent to signal something. And that logic level terminology is key. These components are called MOSFETs and they are magic. They've got three legs. Now, one of the two legs is basically voltage in from the Arduino and the other two legs are a pass through. So, um, you know, you can put your 12 volts through to go through the other two legs. And if you're not getting any voltage from the, from the leg that goes to the Arduino, then the signal doesn't go through. So in effect, they function like a relay. If you get a signal from the Arduino, then voltage goes through it. If there's no signal from the Arduino, then voltage doesn't go through it. So it's an on off switch, kind of. The problem is they're multiplicative. So the signal from the Arduino, it's not binary. It's not either on or off. It's a multiplication. So if you're getting a tiny little signal from the Arduino, then a tiny little bit of current passes. If you get a stronger signal, then more current. And if you get all the signal, then all the current goes through the full 12 volts will go through there. So these particular MOSFETs need 10 volts from the Arduino, and the Arduino is only capable of sending 3.3 volts. So I can't use these. Now, they do make logic level MOSFETs. Now, the problem with those is because they are kind of like scaled down to deal with 3.3 volts, uh, they, the current that they can pass through is really insubstantial. So you can't put a lot of draw on there. I might be able to get away with it uh, just with the raw logic level MOSFET, but uh, I don't want to chance it. I want this to be reliable and not burn up. So I need to build a crazy complicated little circuit called a MOSFET driver circuit, which is something that I've never done before. So there's something new for me to, my, to learn and add into my Arduino repertoire, but um, hmm, there's an easier way. This is a relay. Uh, anybody who's worked on cars has seen one of these. This particular one came off of like a, I think it was like a 1980s Toyota. And it's, uh, it's just a clicky on off switch. I explained a bit you know, previously, it's one of these, but they come in all shapes and sizes. These ones can be driven with five volts. See the five right there? So five volts from the Arduino can uh, change the relay on and off here, but it can handle up to 30 volts. So I can feed my um, 12 volt turn signal, uh, you know, wiring into this and it control it from the Arduino. Now it will make a noise, any port in a storm, right? This will work. It's got moving components inside of it though, so it will eventually fail. Less reliable than if I could come up with a solid state version. So I'm still on the fence, but I have these in my possession right now. I have not built the, um, the driver circuit yet for the MOSFETs. Not only that, but depending on which driver circuit I use, there could be a delay of up to 800 milliseconds. That's eight tenths of a second, which would really throw off the, the timing of the blinker even worse than the time it takes for the physical switch inside of this relay to go over. So because I have these relays in my possession right now, and I haven't come up with the, uh, the circuitry to drive the MOSFET yet, I'm gonna go with this. However, uh, the mechanical nature of this means it's less reliable and there is that timing. 
Uh, I do think that if I spend the time on it, I can get a much more reliable uh, circuit out of this that has a uh, much faster uh, switch over between an on off condition. So in the end, solid state is the way to go. I just have to, um, you know, do the homework. And also it's gonna be more expensive, but you know, we're talking like a couple of bucks more, nothing tragic. When I started going down this rabbit hole a few days ago to help me think through the, uh, the logic of these circuits, I drew up the diagrams here in my CAD program and taking a closer look, we can see uh, that we will also need to run 12 volt switched power. So when you turn the ignition switch on, uh, 12 volts gets sent to the Arduino, which turns the Arduino on. And the Arduino can take up to 10 seconds to turn on, to power on. That's the, uh, that's a, a long startup. But um, I don't know. So you got to wait 10 seconds till your turn signals work. It's not the worst thing. Um, yeah. Also, you can see here that I will need two more step-down voltage regulators coming in from the 12 volt uh, turn signal lines from the motorhome because we can't be back feeding 12 volts through those uh, signals. The, the little buttons that I was pushing, the emulation of those signals. So I'll need three buck converters. And that means that um, without the MOSFET driver circuit, but using MOSFETs here, the total cost is gonna be a lot $11 for, for those two units. So that's not that cheap. Um, I can see why uh, you would charge $50 for this because that's just straight up components, let alone the time that it would take somebody to manufacture this. So even these two units would probably cost $50 if somebody were to sell them. But there's a better way. When engineering things, you want to solve problems at the lowest level possible. You want to get to the root of the problem and not address the symptoms of the problem. So you hear about patches all the time and those are mostly addressing symptoms, but you want to get to the base of it. And in this case, that means rewiring the whole uh, blinker running light circuit for the whole motorhome using uh, logic meant for LEDs. And this type of a solution already exists on the market. There are guys who sell for your classic car, they sell uh, units for this, and they cost like $50. So again, uh, back to that same price tag. And this whole project started when I basically was like, why do those cost $50? That seems to me about $5 in componentry. And sure enough, you can see here, I designed up a whole circuit from the get-go. And it doesn't cut too many wires. It involves uh, spade connectors in where the, uh, the actual flasher click-click units are on the stock motorhome. And yeah, it redesigns the whole thing to be um, run by an Arduino from the get-go. So $4.72 in components. But um, if I were to manufacture this, and I don't have any interest in manufacturing these, if I were to do that, I would probably charge, I don't know, $35, $40 for this, just because there is soldering involved, and you know, you gotta 3D print a case for everything to go into, and all that, so I don't know. There's a small chance that I might sell something like this, but I'd have to get a whole lot of interest to make it worth my time, so. Uh, probably not. And I'm probably not going to implement this either because it's not reversible. Whereas these two little units, they just sort of plug in and all they address is the side uh, marker lights. They don't affect the rest of the system. So the rest of the system in the motorhome will still be um, the same as it was in its stock condition. Never deviate from stock. <laughs> So, right, uh, so you could go to the old manuals and if anybody, if I sell this motorhome to somebody, they won't be confused by a new wiring diagram and have to figure that out or anything like that. So um, yeah, there's pluses and minuses here. The biggest one with this is it is greatly simplified. There's not two units, uh, two separate Arduino units to deal with. And um, yeah, it's a lot cheaper. And there's one more uh, strong argument to be made for doing it at this base level where you sort of rewire uh, all the, the lights. And that is the fact that I'm, I'm having to put that timer in there, uh, the, the, the delay to sync up the turn signals. Now, as you guys might've noticed, in fact, one very uh, clever commenter noticed that the lights were blinking pretty slow in the last video. And that's because the battery was one, run way down. It was down around like 11 volts, I think. And at 11 volts, the physical blinkers don't get hot enough fast enough. And so the time to blink changes. So uh, my timing with the Arduino, not gonna change. So uh, that'll throw the timing off when we're using the delay technique. That's kind of a hack. It's kind of a patch up high. I really shouldn't do it that way. But by having all of the uh, lights, all of the blinkers controlled by a single Arduino, they all get the command to turn on and off at the same time and we won't have any issues. 
Here's some good news. Watch how fast the Arduino boots up. There's a red light here which indicates power to the Arduino and then there's a red light right there and when that thing turns off it means the Arduino is ready to work. See how fast that flashes on and off? So that's turning on within like less than a second, maybe a quarter of a second. Really fast boot up. But the bad news is that there's a significant delay in the time that it takes to turn the uh, blinker off. So it's really quick to load up. You can see that it, it, as soon as I make the connection, it instantly turn the, turns the light on. But when I make the disconnection, there's about a half second delay there. So that um, that's really bad. That means that my blinker is mostly going to be on and it's only gonna turn off for a very brief moment um, with this current setup. Now, I think the problem, I'm like almost certain that the problem is coming from these um, step-down voltage regulators. They're just holding a charge and it's taking half of a second for them to discharge you know, in the capacitors built onto that board. So um, I basically can't use those for my signal line. And my other option, I think, is to use these MOSFETs. So the, the, the 12 volt coming from the motorhome can be used as the signal to the MOSFET and the, the two legs that get connected can be uh, used for the 3.3 logic level voltage. Normally you do it in reverse where the signal line is a weak signal that controls the more powerful voltage going through the, uh, the, the two other legs. So yeah, we'll see um, because this isn't gonna work. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Here's the 12 volt battery. You can see power is being fed in here with the red line. The power, 12 volt power, going here to the switch assembly. So the switches being fed into the MOSFETs and we get nearly instantaneous light. So there is no delay between when the 12 volt signal is sent to when the light lights up. So this is ready for testing inside of the motorhome. Well, it was one of those weeks where I did a ton of work but made very little progress. Now the Arduino controlling the blinkers at the front, that was um, that was something that I, was, I just couldn't not do. You know, you get obsessed and there's just some things where you're like, that's all you wanna do. And uh, I think it just feels much more safe to me having blinkers at both the rear view mirror and at the side there. I want both of those lights to be blinkers and uh, side marker lights. Um, so that's why I'm chasing down the, uh, the Arduino project. And to be continued, I've got more, more to do to, to get that to really work. And you might notice in the background, I've got my friend here uh, welding to, uh, to do a little welding work on the motorhome here. And yeah, as far as the front end goes, it's such a bummer. You know, if I had known that the lug nuts were what was causing that clunk, I doubt that I would have purchased all of these components from Manny uh, until a later date. Now it was definitely on my to-do list to replace both the front and the rear suspension. The rear suspension I'm thinking gonna upgrade to the quad bag system, we'll see. But it's not broken. It works just fine as it is and there are much more pressing issues like, you know, eliminating all the leaks, getting the interior to be, a, you know, actual livable coach, all that kind of stuff. So uh, those were going to be next year or two years out down the line and I only pushed it up because of the clunking noises and it turns out you know previous owner just didn't tighten down lug nuts Ugh, so frustrating <laughs> anyway uh yeah hey big thank you to my patreon supporters I've got a number of you know I think there's seven as of the uh, last week so thank you so much guys uh, it means the world to me this channel actually really could be something all right well that's it for this week Thank you so much for watching. See you in the next one for more, you know, fun renovation on this motorhome. See you then. Bye.